Good morning, everyone. Today I want to talk about leadership. The basis for our discussion comes from the Haftorah, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu appoints Yirmiyahu to be a Navi and a leader of the Jewish people. But I want to talk about leadership in a broader sense. I use Yirmiyahu as a springboard. I think that it's very relevant to us as well because we live in unprecedented times. There are things that are happening at lightning speed in the world around us, such as most of us have never experienced before in our lifetime. And it's important in times of crisis and difficulty that people should be willing to step forward to accept upon themselves positions of leadership. So I want to talk about three leaders in Jewish history. And oftentimes we think that leaders are people that are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They're very talented, exceptionally articulate, great orators, speakers, charismatic. And uh, also we believe that leaders evolve. They, they grow into the position, they, they are cultivated over the years, and then they, as they move up the ladder, they assume positions of leadership. But that's often not the case. So here are three examples of leadership that we find in Tanakh. And in all three instances, the, it was, it, the, the positions of leadership were people who you would have never imagined that they would be in that position. Their talents appeared to be limited. They didn't have the previous skill set. And leadership was thrust on them all of a sudden without time for preparation. The three in people that I'm going to talk about are Esther, Moshe Rabbeinu, and then in conclusion, Yimiyahu, who's the topic of today's Haftar, of the Shabbos's Haftarah. Esther was a, a, a plain, simple girl. Some say that she was married to Mordechai. She grew up in Shushan, minding her own business. And then all of a sudden, she was thrust into a new position, she was sort of like kidnapped and brought to this beauty pageant in front of Ahasuerus after Vashti was beheaded. And to everyone's surprise, and probably to no one's greater surprise than to Esther, she was selected to be the queen of Ahasuerus, who was a ruthless person. He was evil. He was prepared to annihilate the entire Jewish population in his, his kingdom. It's true that Haman convinced them, but Haman was equally evil. But you, if he was convincible, it means that they, they shared the same type of evil uh, uh, morality and personality. So here she's this plain, sweet yeshiva girl is all of a sudden swept up into the palace of Ahasuerus. What happens? Haman convince, uh, convinces Ahasuerus to sign a de decree that on one day every single Jewish person in the kingdom will be put to death. So Mordechai is, uh, faces this impending tragedy and he instructs Esther, you must go to Ahasuerus and plead with him for the people of your nation. So don't think that Esther had a type of relationship that most people have husbands and wives, that the wife could talk to her husband whenever she wants. Absolutely not. Esther, what, how does Esther respond? She says, I haven't been called to the king for 30 days. And everybody knows that if the king doesn't stretch out his, his uh, sharvet to, the, uh, to a person that appears before him, he will be put to death. And she's afraid for her life. You see the type, the character of the relationship. She's afraid to initiate conversation with her husband. That's that's the type, because Ahasuerus was all powerful, and she, although she was selected to be the queen, she didn't have any power whatsoever. So what does Mordechai say to her? She says, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm petrified, I could lose my life. Mordechai says, Al tadami now is not a time to think about your own self. And in Macharesh Tacharish, if you're going to be silent, Somebody else will come along and save the Jewish people. But who knows, if not for this moment, you became the queen. 
It wasn't just by coincidence and accident that you became the queen of Achishverosh. You were intentionally put there by Kaddish Baruch Hu. And Esther, in, in spite of her own trepidation, she rises to the occasion and she invites Haman and Achishverosh to a, to a royal feast. These were the two most powerful people in the world at that time. And they were both nefarious and they were both evil and they were both conniving and plotting. And she has to attempt to outwit Haman and to convince Achashverosh to save the Jewish people. It was, imagine how, what a daunting task that was. And the Navi says, Vatilbash Esther Malchus. She cloaked herself in royalty. And Chazal say royalty means with Ruach HaKodesh. What does it mean she cloaked herself in Ruach HaKodesh with the divine spirit? It means that she went to Achashverosh with the Shechina. You know, they say, God is my co-pilot. He's not the co-pilot. God is the pilot. She went with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He was the one that led her, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in her interaction with Achashverosh and with Haman. And amazingly, she was successful in thwarting the evil design of Haman. She had him executed, hung on a tree, and the Jewish people were saved. So here's an example of a person who you never would have imagined that she would be able to rise to the occasion and that she would be a leader of the Jewish people, but, and she was just thrust into that position. It's not like she was born into royalty, just plucked out of her natural environment and put into that position and she rose to the occasion. That's one example of leadership. A second example is Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Hayaroes, it's sown, he was a shepherd, shepherding the, the, the flock of his father-in-law of Yisro. And he goes, he, he travels into the, into the desert with his flock. He had left Mitzrayim years ago. He had to escape as a fugitive with, with his life because he had killed an Egyptian. Different opinions, how long he's away, 40 years, 60 years. But he was totally disconnected from the Jewish people in Mitzrayim comes along, Moshe sees this burning bush, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu appears to Moshe, and he says, you know what, I want you to go to Paro and tell him, Shalach es Avduni, send out my Jewish people, give them freedom, and they will go into the desert in order to serve me. Now, for Moshe Rabbeinu, who had absolutely no prestige, and no position of importance, he was a lowly shepherd, who was totally disconnected from the Jewish people, to go and appear before Paro and make that st statement. And the Jews had been subjugated in Mitzrayim for 210 years. That was it, 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 the, the, the natural course of history for 210 years that the Jews were slaves in Mitzrayim. What tremendous audacity it required for Moshe Rabbeinu, who was in addition to everything else, on of Mikolodim, he was the most humble person in the world. For him to appear before Paro and say, Paro, let the Jews go. I want them to leave Mitzrayim. God told me and they should leave Mitzrayim. It's imagine if somebody would appear before, in World War II, somebody had come to Hitler, Yamach Shemo, one of the most evil people in all of the history of mankind. And he was said to, to, to Hitler, God sent me to tell you to stop executing the Jews in the concentration camps and to free all the Jewish slaves in the labor camps. Or he would have appeared, gone to, to Stalin, another tremendous Russia, and said, you have to let the Jews leave Russia. It, it would have been laughable. And, and, and no one would have the inner courage to be, to be able to engage these powerful leaders in such a manner. And Paro was, at that time, also perhaps the most powerful figure in, in, the, in the entire world. And he controlled, totally subjugated the Jewish people. They were slaves. Along comes Moshe Rabbeinu and says, Paro, God told me to tell you to let the Jews leave Mitzrayim. So unsurprisingly, Moshe Rabbeinu is stunned. He's startled. HaKadosh Baruch tells him, you should become the leader. Moshe says, Mi anochi ki elecha Paro. Me? <laughs> Who am I? What, how in the world do you expect me to go to Paro. And on top of that, Moshe says, I can't even speak well. I'm a kavat I'm a stutterer. And the lo yaminali. 
I won't even have the support of the Jewish people. It's so ridiculous for me to be the one to go to Mitzrayim and take the Jews out of Mitzrayim. So the Rebbe Shalom, the Rashi says, seven days God had to argue with Moshe Rabbeinu. How could you argue with God for seven days? I don't know. But it took seven days for, for the Rebbe Shalom to change the, 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 um, the, 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 the psyche of Moshe Rabbeinu, that he should accept upon himself a position of leadership, that he now, the most humble of people, who was disconnected from him, now he's going to be the leader of the Jewish people. And he's going to engage Paro, and he's going to force Paro to let the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim. So that's a second example of a person who had no, there was no precedent for him to be a leader. There was no period of preparation. He did not seem to have any of the natural talents necessary, and he was given a task that was overwhelming to appear before Paro. And the reason why, just like Esther, she went with the Rebbe Nishom, the Rebbe told Moshe Rabbeinu as well, Anochi and Picha, I will be with you. I will escort you. I will tell you what to say to the Jewish people and what to say to Paro. And in that way, Moshe Rabbeinu had the courage to become the leader of the great, one of the, the, the greatest leader, Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of the Jewish people. The third example is this week's Haftar, the parsh, the story of Yirmiyo and Avi. I would encourage you to read it carefully. When we read the Haftar tomorrow, you could even prepare it in advance. It is a beautiful story in the Navi. It's not a story. It's, it's a it's a record of history of what happened. The Rivon Shalom appears to 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 Yirmiyahu. And he says to him, Even before you were born, when I formed you in the, in the womb, I already knew you. And even before you exited the womb, I sanctified you. I already had you appointed for this position, even when, when in vitro. HaKadosh Baruch is telling Yirmiyo Yo Navi that you're going to be the Navi Lagoyim Nesatiha. I have appointed you to be a prophet, prophet of the nations. Why is HaKadosh Baruch Hu telling this to Yirmiyo that I already from the time, and why, why did he establish that Yirmiyo should be a Navi or e- even before he was born? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling Yirmiyo, Yirmiyo, you think that who am I, like Moshe said, Mi Anochi, where do I come to be a Navi to prophesize? for the Jewish people and prophesize in front of kings. He I prepared you for that task even before you were born. You were born for this task. So what does Yermiyahu respond? Vayomer Aho, Aho means Alas, or I'm, I'm amazed, I'm stunned. I don't know how to talk. I'm a young lad. He was a young boy. Some say he was only five years old at the time. Others say he was a little older. But he was a young boy. So where does he come to go and speak before t- kings? And Yirmiyahu prophesied in a period of time of Jewish history where there was enormous turmoil and there was the the there was uh, intrigue in the in 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 the uh, in the courts of the kings and Yirmiyahu was a despised prophet and he was undermined by the Nevi, the Nevi Sheker there were false prophets who Yirmiyahu was prophesizing the destruction of Yerushalayim and the Beis Hamikdash and the false prophet says that's ridiculous you don't have to worry about it and the people. Who did they support? Did he have any support from the populace? None at all, because he was prophesizing the most unpopular nevuah possible, that the Yishalayim is going to be in the Beis HaMikdash, will destroy it. The people thought the Beis HaMikdash is invincible. And he was at one point, he was, he was arrested and he was thrown into prison and they threatened to kill him. And then when he wrote the, uh, the Medrash of Eicha, Yumiyo was the author of Eicha, and he handed it to the king, and the king took it, and he tossed it in, into the fire. 
He was a Navi for 40 years. He prophesied doom and destruction. So he was given an enormously difficult task. So when did he, when was he appointed? Do you think it was when he was 60 years old or 70 and he was very learned and he was accomplished Talmud Chacham and he had a lot of experience in, in politics? No, he was appointed as a young child. And he says, what do you want from me? I don't know how to talk. Kinar Anochi. I'm a child. How in the world are you expecting me to, to assume this position? So Yvonne Shalom says, Al Tomar Nar Anochi. Don't say I'm a child. That's the you you have no right to say that. Ki al call al Whatever I tell you to do, to to go, wherever I tell you to go, you should go. Vase call share at Sevecha Tidaber. And whatever I command you, you should speak. Al Tira Mipnehem. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by the kings. He dealt with various kings. Again, God says, I'm going to be with you and you do not have to be worried. I saw Rav Yerucham Levavitz, who was the great mashkiach of the Mir Yeshiva. He writes in a magnificent passage. I just want to get the safer. Rav Yerucham says, Kama kochos Look how many talents were lost. Kama gedola Yisrael hefsanu. Look how many people who could have been Gedola Yisrael, the leaders of the Jewish people, did we lose? Why? They didn't hear the calling of a Kaddish Baruch Hu where he said to Yemio, "Do not say I am a child." Al Tomar Nar Anochi, because the natural, natural, natural response of a person is to say, like Moshe said, "Me Anochi who, me? You think I'm going to be a leader? Where do I come to be a leader? I must tell you that in the course of my lifetime, I have seen many people who have become tremendous leaders of the Jewish people, people who have become Rosh Hashivas, people who have become Rabbanim, and I knew them in their youth. And if you would have had to predict that they were going to be successful in their positions and effective and have an enormous impact, at the time before they began that journey, you would have said, come on, these, pe- these are not the people who are going to rise to positions of importance. I remember in particular two Rabbanim, I, who are enormously effective speakers. I heard them speak 25, 30 years ago, and they were bombs. They, the first time I heard them speak, it was a catastrophe. They stuttered, they mumbled, they had no confidence. They said things that were inappropriate. In fact, one of them I afterwards went over and I said, you know, I, I, let me just give you some, some advice. You sh- this is not what you shouldn't be saying this in a, in a drasha. And today, they are outstanding leaders of the, of the Jewish community. I know people who became Rosh Yeshiva and, and in their youth, they were just plain nice people and they weren't even, they didn't excel intellectually. They were not brilliant. They were nice guys and they rose to the occasion. So there is, it's not a good excuse to say, Kinar Anochi, that I'm just a child, that I'm incapable, that it's, it, these are insurmountable tasks that I have, have to do. I spoke a few times about my Rebbe, Rav Chaim Shulevitz, the Mir Rosh Yeshiva. Rav Chaim was a brilliant Hamachacham, Chacham, but when the Mir Yeshiva, and he had nothing to do with politics and, and dealing with, uh, with, with, with politicians, when the Mir Yeshiva was forced to flee and they ended up in Shanghai, Rav Chaim, who was the Rosh Yeshiva, he was a great Talmud Chacham, and, but he, a, a brilliant person, but he didn't have necessarily great street smarts. He was thrust into that position where he had to negotiate with the Japanese officials. And on more than one occasion, he had to meet with people and, and, and it was assumed that he would not leave the office of those Japanese officials alive because they were ruthless and there was a history and yet somehow or another Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, the yeshiva bacher, or he wasn't the bacher anymore, but the yeshiva guy, he rose to the occasion and he was able to be the leader of the yeshiva for seven years and he brought them the, out, of, out of Shanghai in, into liberation. So the message here is 
we're living in very difficult times. There's so much turmoil going on. And when things are in turmoil, when everything is so uncertain, there's a, a dearth of leadership. There's a need for people to come forward and to take responsibility. And there's just so many different ways. Not everybody, I can't you know, give you an exact formula. You do this and you do that. But there's always opportunities for leadership. There's always opportunities for a person to come forward and say, you know what, I'm going to take care of this. I will assume the responsibility. And people surprise themselves. When they take on a position, they grow into the position, sometimes immediately, sometimes over the course of time. But people have tremendous inner strengths that they never even are aware of. And a person could go through life and miss his calling because he says, Ki like Yemiel said to Baruch Hu, what, what do you want from me? I'm a little child. If a Baruch Hu said, okay, Yemiel, you're right. You're a nar, you're a young lad. Let's forget it. I'll go look for somebody else. Then you never would have heard of Yemiel. But what an enormous loss it would have been for Kal Yisrael. So but the, please study that Torah, read it carefully. The, the Rav Shalom tells you, Miyahu, be- another beautiful passage. He says, Hayom hazeh, re'e hifkadati hayom hazeh, hifkadaticha hayom hazeh. See, I point you to this day, over al hagayim, ba'amamachos, over the nations and over kingdoms, lintots, lintosh v'lintots, to uproot and to smash, l'havid l'haros, to destroy and to overthrow, livnos v'lintoa, and to build and to plant. You'll have enormous capability and power, not your own power, but through my, uh, my assistance or through the guidance of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, to affect enormous things. You'll be able to destroy forces of evil and you will be able to build forces of goodness and greatness. So let's take that message to heart. It's the beginning of the three weeks. It's a time of churban of destruction. And when there's Chorban, there's a need to rebuild. Just like Kaddish Baruch Hu told Yumiel, you'll destroy and you'll rebuild. We have to rebuild. And the world is in a state of turmoil. We need Jewish leadership. We need people who are inspired to, to come forward. And in Mirz Hashem, if we'll be inspired in this manner, we'll be able to accomplish great things.